We're back. This is the Now Morning Show. And as you might know, the university students have been returning from around the Caribbean. But what about those who are thinking about the next term and what's going to be put in place for incoming students at the University of the West Indies? Well, I have on the line Professor Brian Copeland, principal of the University of the West Indies. Good morning, Professor. Hi, good morning, Lisa. How are you? I am doing very well, especially Hi. now that um, we're able to converse because I always enjoy having these conversations with you, Professor Copeland. Um, the last time we were talking about masks and manufacturing of masks, we'll come to that. But right now, I want to find out how has COVID impacted operations at the university? Well, like every other institution, it certainly has affected us. We've had to, to move our operations um, uh, from the on-campus site. We've moved online with our work. Yes. We have continued teaching using online platforms. Um, and um, even our exams are being conducted online. Um, our exams should, be, should have been finished um, this week mm -hmm. or late last week. Right. Uh, but we had to move everything online um, because of COVID. And what plans are in place for the university for the intake of UE students for the new term? Okay, so we, we are accepting students. And in fact, anyone who's interested um, could go to the UE website. That's sta.ue.edu slash mm -hmm. apply. Um, there's a special page here with all the information that anyone would not pick up here today. Yes. But in terms of our, our um, operations, what we see is that we, uh, um, with the nation moving from one phase to the other, um, and government saying now people can come out, we are well aware that COVID is still there. Mm -hmm. And we put um, the safety of our students and our staff um, at, at, um, at, as, a, as a high priority. So we will be, for students, we will be offering our, um, our programs in what we call a hybrid mode, yeah. which means that um, those programs or components of programs that can be delivered online will continue to be delivered online. Um, there will be some adaptation that's required, some prepared preparation that's required um, for some students. Um, those components that cannot be done online, we will make the appropriate um, uh, arrangements observing the, the COVID protocols to ensure that our students remain safe. So for example, laboratories, we will ensure that students are properly spaced, um, that the labs are cleaned uh, uh, after, after use, yeah. um, and so on. Same for staff, um, we'll have, um, we are we'll be working on a sort of a rotation basis um, in those offices that are tightly packed, there are some like that. Um, so some people will be at home, some will be at work, and then they rotate um, uh, uh, during the course of the week or whatever time that the, the head the unit head uh, determines. And again, <clears throat> appropriate COVID protocols will be in place to ensure uh, distancing. <clears throat> uh, staff will be provided with, with masks, um, with a mask that uh, we, we are just about finishing right now. Um, so at least they would have something to prepare um, to, to show up their defenses against a COVID attack. Professor, in terms of remote working, do you anticipate that this is the new way forward? Well, it is. Uh, what COVID has done is that it has um, pushed the, if you call it a ship, of what our society was pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. It has given, given it a great big push in a different direction. And um, we see that uh, there are some pros and cons to the, to the working, the remote work. Uh, we've been doing it uh, in emergency mode, so it still has to be properly evaluated. Yeah. But I think, in fact, what we'll be seeing going forward is that, um, yes, that there'll be a, a, a shift, not a complete shift <clears throat> to remote work. There are some things that you have to be there physically for. But if you can complete the work, and I've always been a, a proponent of this, if you can do your work well um, uh, from some remote, remote location, most times, of course, it will be home, then we will facilitate that. Yeah. But certainly, um, there will be two phases we see. One is until such time as a vaccine is found, and then after a vaccine is found, what, what do we do? So we have to plan for that second phase. But certainly, in that um, early phase, what some people call post-COVID, um, kind of worry as to what that means, um, uh, we will be into a remote work or a hybrid remote work scenario. Do you anticipate a fall in the number of students, Professor? I'm sorry to hear you clearly at all. Do you anticipate a fallout in terms of student numbers? Right. Um, in terms of student numbers, uh, it would be irresponsible not to expect some fallout. 
And what that means is that our marketing has to be a little bit more on the ball to make sure the numbers get back up. The fact is that we think that we can offer a safe um, sort of um, university for students to study in. Yeah. The biggest concern will be um, uh, in terms of um, economics and resources for students. Uh, we, we, are, we are looking, we've done our research, um, we're hearing comments from many um, that, well, you know, some students will not have the wherewithal to go through um, this university education. We're prepared to assist as far as, we, as far as we could, as much as we could, to sort of counter that. So, quite frankly, we will not know until we actually hit the ground. But we are planning um, and uh, for for start of the academic year, which is August first. We the university has set that date; it has not moved the date. Mm-hmm. And we are also planning to aggressively market um, the the um, the uh, potential. Um, I call them clients. Uh, some people don't like the term, but uh, we are we're moving to an aggressive marketing campaign to ensure that uh, that our students. Um, that, that we see as a sufficiently rich student uh, population at the start of the year. Yeah. You know, some students might be assessing wh- how important tertiary education is at this time in this new normal. Yeah. How important is tertiary education, do you think, in the, new f- in, the, in the future, coming forward, coming after COVID-19? That's a good question, Lisa. It is certainly much more important than it was before because regardless of what happens, you have to rebuild. Now, if you have to rebuild a, a, a strong, robust society, um, if you have to, to reset, as uh, some people are saying, rethink what society is, you need your best people on board. And they have to be trained. In fact, the, the statistics show several things. One is that during a recession, that the demand for, for tertiary education increases. But also, um, those who survive, regardless of whether they session or not, uh, the vast majority of people who survive in the end are those who have a tertiary level education. So it is a must. There's also the whole issue of uh, income divide. And I'm proud to say that when I look at what's going on, for example, in the U.S., um, I think we've been doing quite well in terms of um, addressing the underserved. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you look at those reports in the U.S., um, you see a lot of the colleges that we put on a high pedestal, they have actually been catering only to the very rich. We have been doing our best to ensure that we we um, we address the needs of the underserved, providing providing them with the education they need to come out of whatever situation they are in. So when you add it all together, in fact, there is a tremendous need, more so now than before, for tertiary level education. I know you always speak about innovation, so I anticipate innovative ways of learning coming out of the University of the West Indies as we move forward after COVID. Uh, we spoke a lot about the students. What is the university doing with regard to its workforce in terms of empowering the workforce to deal with this new environment? Yeah, um, so we've, we've actually not stopped working. A lot of our staff have worked through the, the, um, the, the, uh, the lockdown period. Our security was always on the ground. We gave them the required PPE. We have cleaners coming out, of course. But now that we are ramping up, what we are doing is we are first of all checking our plant. Um, that phase is almost completed. And we have a, a multi-phase rollout of a return to work um, sort of plan, um, uh, which we have in fact taken great pains to, to document. So for example, in the very first phase, we expect only uh, managers and heads to come out, assess their situation, and work out um, and, and determine the work plans um, uh, for, for the staff who are under them, determining who will come in on what days, who will work from home on what days, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, those types of rotations have to be worked out in, in the minutest detail, and the best people to do that will be the, the managers. So that, um, that uh, was supposed to have started this week, as a matter of fact. And then um, we'll be looking to see if we can advance the other phase where we progressively get to the stage where we can bring students back um, uh, onto the campus as needs be. But the staff will be well taken care of. Um, we have the our guidance. Communication is a major tool in this COVID uh, time, as well as the physical distancing. Um, the other PP and all that stuff we've looked at, and um, we, we have decided that we will uh, give those packages to staff as they return. Professor, what about the matriculation requirements? Do they remain the same? No, we've changed matriculation. I need to make it clear that matriculation is... Um, is not an actual entry requirement. What it is, it's basically telling people, here is the minimum that you need for us to consider you. And we have rolled that back a bit um, from from the two capes, 
um, two sets of Cape from one year to the next. So just having um, Cape One, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so with one year of Cape, we will in fact now consider you. Once you have registered for the Cape Two, that is what we have done. Now, the faculty requirements are, are much more stringent. And I don't know of any faculty that has adjusted their requirement at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But the matriculation allows us to at least look at a larger pool of students um, and give them a bit more consideration. By the way, it's something we've always meant to do. So COVID has, has forced that. Um, but the faculty requirements uh, remain as stringent, although faculties can make an adjustment in their requirements. That, that has always been the case. Yes. There's some latitude there. And what we're telling them is that with the new matriculation requirements, this is as far as you go. You cannot go below this. Mm -hmm. So we have quite um, a lot of people are concerned, Lisa, about, about quality. And I've always maintained quality is not about so much about the input, but about the output. Yes. We will be making adjustments in the program to ensure the output remains the same and that the university quality um, retains its, its high standard. Yeah, you anticipated my question about quality by answering that there. Um, before I let you go, Professor, when you were last on, you were speaking about the manufacturing of masks and ventilators by the yeah. university. Any update? Oh, yeah. Um, that has gone quite, quite well. Um, we have worked with Curry to work on uh, a certification of masks. So we'll be putting a certification mask, mark on those masks that um, Curry determined um, are suitable for use. Remember, there's a whole balance of blocking um, uh, whatever is in the air, including the, the, the virus, mm -hmm. but there's also the issue of breathability. Um, you have to be able to breathe in the mask. So they have uh, been able to grade different masks using uh, tools that they have gotten, assistance from the Ministry of, Ed, of, um, of Health, and we're working with the, with the, uh, the private sector to, 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 to produce those masks or um, have those masks tested if they, if they bring the masks in. That has happened. The okay. face shields have gone quite well, and um, we have had the private sector again assist us both with, um, with producing those masks and donating masks to, to various um, entities. Um, the, the, the toughest one we face is the manufacture of ventilators, where we could see very clearly the impact of COVID on, on, um, on shipping supplies, yeah. especially if it's medical equipment or medical equipment parts you're talking about. Yeah. We have a design that has been tested um, on the computer. It's simulated. It works well. We, uh, modern technology allows us to do that. But we've had difficulty getting in all the parts. I think by today we should have all the parts and I should be able to assemble a, a working unit. The, the, the intent there is to um, have, a, uh, have the ability uh, to manufacture um, of ventilators in case the need arises. Remember, we may have uh, future waves of COVID. Yeah. And when that happens, um, the world supplies can get choked again. Yeah. We are at the bottom end of the ladder when, you, when it comes to supplies. So we have to make sure we take care of ourselves. Well, I was thinking yeah. that um, our numbers, we have been fortunate in that our numbers do not yes. require as many ventilators as had been anticipated. But certainly, if we keep our numbers down and the university manufactures, then we can look at export. But that's another conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, all right. we have all iron it. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Brian Copeland, principal of the University of the West Indies, and continue to okay. be safe. We'll stay and in touch. Absolutely, sir. All right, all the best to you. All right. Okay, we're going to take in a few messages, guys, and when we come back, we're talking to the Chamber of Commerce, particularly the NOVA committee members, to find out what's in store for small and medium enterprises and micro businesses. So come back for that.